Coming up tonight on NET's Big Red Wrap-Up. It was a literal fist fight on Saturday as Nebraska ran over Miami. Former Husker Damon Benning will help us recap a wild night at Memorial Stadium. And Sean Callahan will join us for an update on Big Red Recruiting. Everybody, I'm Kevin Kugler, and welcome to NET's Big Red Wrap-Up. It was one of the more anticipated non-conference games in recent years for Nebraska. Certainly the most anticipated game this year on the Nebraska home schedule. And it did not disappoint on Saturday night in Lincoln as the Huskers get the victory over Miami amidst a raucous crowd, controversy on the field. Now Nebraska 4-0 and as they head into conference play this weekend hosting Illinois. Joining me as always, Adrian Fiala and Blake Lawrence. Saturday night was one that a lot of fans and certainly those players are going to remember for a very long time. That was Absolutely. quite the atmosphere and quite the night for Nebraska football. It's a, it's a football game etched in your mind that will never go away. And uh, really great to see it. Great outcome, as you said, Kevin. And, and I'm just I'm so proud of, of the way those guys handled all the, all the difficult parts of the game. Because we know when Miami comes into play, not only here but in a lot of places, uh, you're looking at all the, all the cute stuff, so mm -hmm. to speak. And our guys handled it really well and didn't really let it to lead to a lot of penalties or that kind of thing. And then they, they were just composed and they got the job done. And, and of course, our defense uh, stepped up and played very well. And can't say enough about our offense and what they did with Amir Abdullah and, and Tommy Armstrong, both in that old line. So. I tell you what, I, I sat there, watched that game, and talked about the game, and I was a little bit of heaven as things were going along, and I hope we continue to be that way. Did anything from that game, Blake, surprise you? You know, I was surprised with how Coach Beck took what Miami gave him from a running standpoint. There was times when, when Beck wanted to go to the passing game, and you saw an interception, you know, thrown by Tommy Armstrong. Tommy threw very well against a, a great Miami secondary but the offensive line, the way that they were able to dominate Miami, who was a, a top defense against the run, and see Amir Abdullah break out. I mean, I wasn't surprised about Amir, but I was surprised to see the offensive line accept the challenge that Abdullah put in front of them and dominate mm -hmm. Miami all day, all night. As always, we want to hear from you. Our phone lines standing by wide open for you with the guys from Nebraska's Phi Gamma Delta, the Fijis who are enjoying some Valentino's pizza while they wait for your calls. We've also got eager eyes watching out for your emails, Facebook comments, and tweets. We've seen a lot of good ones already. Keep them flowing. We're going to ask a lot of those questions tonight, not only amongst us, but with our guests coming up and Damon Benning in just a bit. Heading our call center, our NET Sports intern, Josh, will be hearing from him a little bit later on. Log on to our website at netnebraska.org slash Big Red. You can download an 8x10 version of this year's Big Red wrap-up schedule poster. It's a great size for just about any space. We've also got some full-size posters still left here at the NET studios for you to pick up. Just swing by during regular business hours and grab one to celebrate the start of conference season. Also, don't forget to download our NET Nebraska app. You can watch live streaming of our show, catch up on previous episodes, check out features, and much more. Simply download from your app store, and you can follow NET Sports on the go. Now, while we've got plenty to talk about from the game, and we're going to do that, there appears to have been an injury out of that game. We don't know what's going on with this injury yet. Reports from practice today, David Santos was seen with a brace on his knee. Now, there's no official word from Nebraska as of yet. Bo Pelini is not scheduled to speak to the media until Thursday, and Coach Pelini is the only one who can comment on injuries. John Papucha's defensive coordinator could not comment today. That's team policy. So we'll know more on Thursday when Bo Pelini speaks, but in a linebacker core that has some ups and downs right. and has already lost, of course, Michael Rose in the preseason, you don't want to see another guy go down. There. Yeah, you can't afford to do that, especially given the fact that Santos had a very good game the other night. He had a couple of mistakes, but overall he played very well, I would say. Uh, you just can't afford to lose that experience and, and try to build up from the bottom now, which is if he's out, then that's what will happen. But Trevor Roach stepped up. Uh, we talked about him before. He's a very tough, steady ball player. He's been around a number of years. Uh, he can get the job done also, guys. But, but uh, I, I tell you what, the, the backers made some good plays Saturday night. Some really good plays at times, and then we're woefully short on, on some of the coverages that we talked about. But uh, let's hope that Santos is all right and 
Josh ben, uh, Banderas can come back and play, and and uh, Zaire Anderson can get the job done. I think I think those guys will pull it up if, if Santos can't. But it's uh, it's certainly. Certainly not a good situation, Blake, when you when you take one of your main uh, wheels out. No, I always say that David Santos, he had 10 tackles on Saturday, and there's some times he was out of position, but Trevor Roach did a good job of filling in. I think that Trevor is the type of linebacker, he knows exactly what he's supposed to do on every play. He's got speed to the ball, but when you haven't had as much game time experience as, as maybe Santos has, he's a little bit slow for, with his first reaction. Uh, but I did like what I saw of Trevor Roach with yeah. the forced fumble and things there. So this this team, they've been able to kind of shuffle it through some linebackers they did on Saturday night. So I'm not too fearful, but uh, you hope Santos is not hurt, hurt for too long. So. Well, and Miami did what really what I expected them to do, and that's uh, work those short intermediate passes. Mm -hmm. We talked about it all last week, uh, both on the talk show and I don't know if we talked about it here or not, but they, I think we did. But uh, they did what, what I thought. And we're not going to stop all of them. You know, they're going to get some of them, so, but you just deal with what you can. The other part of it is the secondary was playing deep enough because they certainly did not want to get beat deep with all that Miami speed. So they're, they're back a little bit, and they're leaving a little bit more room mm -hmm. in the hole, as we used to say, and whatever you call it now. And, uh, and so that created a little bit of an opportunity for them to complete those passes. So all in all, look at the score. That's what I like yeah, the best. <laughs> Blake, is it, is it to the point where you say – that Nebraska's offense is going to be what carries this team at least over the next month or so? Or is the defense at this point now, do you say, capable of holding its own? At the beginning of the year, we all talked about how the offense right. was going to right. be ahead of the game. Where are we a month in? Well, I would say that right now that Nebraska's defense developed a personality on Saturday night. We had seen a team that, had, you know, played pretty well as a whole unit, but when they start to get turnovers, when they start to have a little bit of swagger to them, and, and just everyone's kind of getting more confident. Nate Gary back at safety, he's four games in, he's playing lights out. You got Kalu, a true freshman, who you wouldn't guess he's a true freshman the way he plays the game. Yeah. Randy Gregory's healthy. Malik Collins has confidence. These guys have a personality. I think that the Nebraska defense will get turnovers because they're more confident, and if the offense runs the ball, holds onto the ball. This could be a complete team. I really liked what I saw Saturday. And when you shut a team down and keep them at 76 yards rushing, right? that's that's the key. We all know that's the key to great defense. You've got to stop that rushing game. You do that and you can deal with the rest. Yeah, so. make them and they did that. And they did. Goes you, bet. Well. you bet. Here are the results of last week's sideline survey. We asked which Husker player for you is a bigger game changer, Amir Abdullah. 66%. I think he proved that once again on Saturday night that he is indeed a big game changer. 22% for Randy Gregory, 8% Kenny Bell, 4% for Tommy Armstrong Jr. Now let's take a look at this week's all-new sideline survey. Where do you think Nebraska will finish in the Big Ten West Division? I am stunned to see the early predictions have Nebraska in first place. It's <laughs> almost as if this, this is going out to people in the state. Just go to our Facebook <laughs> or wrap-up website and cast your vote in our very unscientific sideline survey we will wait no longer we will go to the highlights we will show you a sellout crowd i know that's a surprise for a game that was heavily anticipated the team coming out of the tunnel following the 1994 national championship team that came out and that was an emotional scene with tom osborne and ron brown pushing milt Teniper out who's battling leukemia right now charlie mcbride who looks no older than he did when he left the huskers and right to the air on the first play, 15 yards in Miami to the 40-yard line to start things off. And Miami's got a good young quarterback who made a lot of very nice plays, made some mistakes as freshmen are wont to do, but a very good quarterback and a very good start for Miami as they march it down the field, nine plays, 75 yards, and a 7-0 lead for the Hurricanes. And, you know, Kevin, uh, I know lots of people, including me, were sitting there going, hmm, what's going on here right now? But here's, here's the difference. Right here, the, our offense comes back and just pushes it right down the field, scores. So you know, you know at that point, it's toe to toe. We're going to be in for a great ball game. 17 for number eight, and then number four goes 17 as well. Back to back runs, Abdullah and Armstrong. Nebraska in good shape, first down, and then Tommy Armstrong to the air. Kenny Bell open, hit him in stride. Bell a little bit of a stiff arm, shrug of the shoulders. And Kenny Bell scores to make it a 7-7 ball game. I love how Kenny is so quick to react when he gets the ball in his hands. Great receiver. Now, one of the things Nebraska's done pretty well this year is maintain possession of the football. They do not hear the fumble forced by Bush, recovered by Miami. Hurricanes on the move. Hurricanes take advantage. 
Duke Johnson, pretty good running back in his own right. 32 Absolutely. yards down to the Nebraska six-yard line. Absolutely a very good running back. What I liked about him is his ability to bounce the ball out. Did that very well as we see the big pass right there to uh, Clive Walford. He's, he's a big guy, 6'4 and about 260. He's a guy you're going to go to down in that area. Tommy Armstrong back to work with his team trailing once more. Finds Kenny Bell once more. Defender on his back hip and a little bit frustrated, as you can tell. 17-yard completion of the 23. Then Tommy Armstrong calls his own number again. Gets a good block out front. Picks up nine yards to the Miami six-yard line. This drive continuing, churning, pounding. And on third and goal, Tommy Armstrong finds Amir Abdullah just tough, muscling his way in, tied at 14. Amir Abdullah, that was a creative pass play in the way that they blocked it, brought a guy out to block the receiver, brought the, re or the receiver to come in and, and take care of the linebacker. Great pass play, great run by Abdullah. And there's six yards for Amir Abdullah. We show you that because that sets the school record for all-purpose yards. Johnny Rogers now in second behind Amir Abdullah. And that drive ends with a 19-yard field goal as it bogged down just a bit, 17-14. Nebraska takes the lead into the locker room. Third quarter, Huskers get the ball to start, and they take advantage. 15 yards to the Miami 42-yard line. On first down and 10 at the 32, Tommy Armstrong calls his own number again. Got another good block. Nice little cutbacks down to the 17-yard line. First and goal at the, at the Miami 6-yard line, Amir Abdullah. Little crease, wriggles through, gets the touchdown, 24-14 Nebraska. You like that play immensely because he just, he was not to be denied. He was running through tackles around people and just, uh, again, forced his, his, himself and his will into that touchdown. Great play by Amir Abdullah. Johnson down to the Nebraska 20-yard line as Miami answers right back. First and goal from the nine. Lewis on the grab. Lewis with the touchdown. Miami back within three. 24-21. Maybe the most pivotal play of the game right here. Duke Johnson coughs it up, bobbles out. Everybody thinks it's dead. You see how everybody stopped? Not Josh Mitchell. He picks it up, and he's gone for the touchdown. I love this play. I had to watch it a couple times to make sure he wasn't down, but Trevor Roach just got in there. When he's held up, legs aren't, knees aren't down, get the ball out, and that was a surprising turnover. We needed that one in this game. All right, now an interception comes here. And there was a little bit of controversy after this one because the interception, which looked like it could be enough to really just ice this game almost if Nebraska goes down to score, the fight breaks out afterwards. But the flag down, you see the flag, roughing the passer is the call. They are going out of their way to protect quarterbacks, especially on low shots. I know Bo Pelini didn't like the call. We'll talk about it a little bit later on. But Miami keeps the possession. It ends in a 34-yard field goal. And instead of Nebraska up 10 with the ball, Miami gets three on the board, and they're down seven. Now a field goal by Brown makes it a 34-24 game, and then another huge play by the Nebraska defense and Josh Kalou. Really great job by Josh Kalou dropping into that zone. Uh, the freshman uh, got, he got his legs in this game. He really did, and uh, makes another huge play for the Huskers and pretty much seals it up uh, in a lot of ways for Nebraska. And then. A little extra work right there, and he's not backing off. I love to see a very, very uh, strong, aggressive nature, Josh Kalou. And then Amir Abdullah, 10-yard touchdown run over the right side, makes it 41-24. Late touchdown, not shown, makes it 41-31. <laughs> and that is the final. Nebraska gets the victory. They are now 4-0, 41-31, the final. Good win by Nebraska to close out the non-conference schedule and the final numbers. You could find similar proportion numbers many, many times in Nebraska football history. 343 yards rushing, 113 passing, only 13 pass attempts. But when your run game is as successful and you cash in on turnovers to the degree Nebraska did, you don't really need to throw the ball that Kevin, yeah, that's the key right there. Turnovers, we see three. Uh, actually, Nebraska had two of them, but at any rate, they took the ball away at opportune times. A fumble recovery and a pass interception that really put it together for the Huskers. That has to happen more and more as the season goes. No, it was a very strong night indeed for Nebraska. They get the win 41-31. It's time for this week's trivia question. Be the first correct caller, and you'll receive that one. The Big Red Wrap-Up T-shirt, size extra large. Plus, two free tickets to our upcoming event at the Champions Club one week from tonight. You'll get to be a part of our live audience that night. Get a chance to meet... Special guests, former Huskers Matt Davison and Jay Foreman will be there. If you really want to, you can say hi to us as well. 
That'll be a thrill for you. Nebraska last played Miami in the 2002 National Championship game where they lost 37-14 to a Hurricane team considered to be one of the greatest in college football history. How many players on that year's Miami roster would eventually be drafted into the National Football League? Be the first correct caller and you'll receive those two free tickets to join us on September 30th and the wrap-up tee, which you can wear on the 30th to join us. Now it's time to look closer at a few key defensive plays. Blake Lawrence is in the huddle. Tonight in the huddle, we'll look at defense. The last four plays by Nebraska's defense, which was almost a goal line stand to end the game. To have a goal line stand, you need an all-around team effort. We're going to look at four plays in a row, a play by the, the secondary, a play by the defensive end, and a play by the defensive tackle. The first play, uh, first and goal, we're going to look at Nate Gary. On the goal line, his job is to set the edge and make sure he gives time for his linebackers to get outside and make the tackle. So once he gets on the fullback, those linebackers flood in and make the stop. Great job by the secondary down on the goal line. Now this is an interesting play. The defensive end is going to make the play here. Miami goes to a play action, and play action really only works if you sell the pass, or sell the run before you go to the pass. Watch the tight end here. The tight end, he's gonna sprint straight out, and that's gonna give Randy Gregory a free shot on the quarterback. The quarterback uh, might have some time to find the guy in the back of the end zone, but Gregory gets in his face, forces a quick throw. No one's open because no one really bought the fake because the tight end went out right away. The third play, my favorite play of this drive, Malik Collins is turning into a monster on the inside. Watch how quickly he disrupts this play. They're going to try and pull three guys to the left side of the line. If they do that, Nebraska is outnumbered. This could be an easy touchdown. But Malik Collins gets under, and he drives this, the center for Miami four yards in the backfield. He makes the tackle without even getting his hands off the center. Phenomenal play by a young guy that's going to be very good for this defensive line. Now the fourth play, very interesting. I want to teach you something about this blitz. Coach Bo calls up an all-out blitz. This is not something you typically do at this uh, this. Uh, point in the goal line stand, but he's going to have Trevor Roach, the inside linebacker, grab the center, and his job is to hold onto the center while the two guys blitz to the outside of him. Once he does that, he's dropped back into coverage. Now, this is a great blitz, but against three receivers on one side, you're supposed to check out and just run your pass coverage. Bo doesn't do that. He gets a little bit aggressive here. You can see that Roach, he engaged and backs out into coverage. But with three guys and only two to cover him, it's just not enough men. Miami scores, but I think there's a moral victory for those first three plays of the goal line stand. Nebraska wins big anyways. We like this. So, Blake, this is a series, obviously, that didn't end the way Nebraska wanted it to. But overall, you take a positive from that series? Yeah, I think so. I think that if you look at the base goal line package, Coach Bo, he calls the same play. I mean, when you get into that giant formation, he, they just flex on the side, they get all these extra linemen in there, and you gotta just play man football. And they did that. Until the last play, they went to a, a very aggressive blitz, which they, they were supposed to check out of it. You can see Bo going, play it, play it. But I think that when you see the safety playing so well in the last drive of the game, you see the defensive tackle blowing up the center, the, the defensive end getting aggressive. It just gives you a lot of pride as a defender to see those guys do that so late in the game. Well, what struck me about that whole series, I, I thought it was a great uh, execution of the defense. But when you have a back like Duke Johnson, and I talked about it earlier in the show, a guy that can hit up inside and then bounce out so quick, uh, he wasn't able to do any of that. Uh, right. they, they contained it all. So I really had... <laughs> Coming out of my seat on that play, it really was. But great stuff. And that last touchdown, well, you know, okay, we'll give it to you. But uh, we, we all know what, what it really was. Yep. Well, one note to add to the day a familiar name is back at the University of Nebraska. Boyd Epley has returned to the athletic department. He is the assistant athletic director. He'll basically be overseeing strength and conditioning. He will not be involved with football. He'll oversee every sport but football. His main responsibilities will be with Darren Erstad and the baseball team. And we thought tonight we'd pay tribute to the godfather of strength and conditioning, climbing in the vault to get this segment from Husker history. While winning has been standard practice at Nebraska, there was a time when one piece of that winning puzzle was not. Like all other college football programs in the 1960s, Nebraska did not have a dedicated strength and conditioning program. 
That all changed in 1969 when Hall of Fame coach Bob Devaney hired Boyd Epley as the first full-time paid strength coach in history. Though Devaney was worried that the lifting would slow his players down, the Cornhuskers began showing large gains in strength, speed, and athleticism. Epley's Husker power would eventually help in building a winning tradition at Nebraska over the next four decades. The core ideas of Husker power have been translated to other programs as well since its inception. Boyd Epley's contributions to Nebraska led him to found the National Strength and Conditioning Association in 1978 and is widely recognized as the godfather of strength and conditioning in college football today. Nebraska's weight room, now bearing the name the Indomitian Sioux Strength and Conditioning Center, continues the elite training that has made Husker power a strong part of Husker history. Boyd Epley as he rejoins the Nebraska Athletic Department. Next up, we're joined by former Husker running back Damon Benning. Should be a spicy segment. As we go to break, let's enjoy some images from the Rowdy game on Saturday, courtesy Aaron Babcock from Hale Varsity. Stay with us. We're back in just a moment. got to improve each and every week and uh don't settle for where we're going right right now you know we got a we got a good win last week but it starts all over this week i think our coaches are really good at that you know they they always say you know the biggest game is the next game you have up and which i think is true because you know i mean we got humbled by mcneese state you, you can't ride the highs and lows uh you know the the, the, the fact is that the film doesn't lie and, and there's there's some things that yeah we did well and you build on that but you also have to keep fighting to get better because we are not the finished product. Welcome back to NET's Big Red Wrap-Up. I'm Kevin Kugler, joined by our NET Sports intern, Josh. Exciting game, huh? It was. I got a chance to go, and I have to say it was one of the funnest games I've been to at my four years here. So It's only been four years. That's it's a lot only more. four years. What are we seeing tonight <laughs> on social media? Well, I think we should get the people on the Facebook page to kind of start uh, campaigning for Amir, for Heisman, because there's a lot of people talking about the way he played. And uh, there's also a little bit of worry with Illinois coming in after a big win like this and then Michigan State looming on the road, um, you know, the next week that maybe it might be a classic trap game. We don't play as well at home and maybe get the loss. But, you know, people are pretty positive about it. And uh, also the crowd. The crowd was uh, really stand up on Saturday night at Memorial Stadium. And we have some standout posts from uh, social media. 
Uh, we have a former guest, Mitch Sherman, who tweeted, uh, angry Nebraska fans, seriously, never seen this, not even Texas, not even close. <laughs> and uh, we also have a meme sent into us on our Facebook message from Madeline. And uh, we have a nice little picture here of that moment when the Miami fan realizes he should have been a Husker. <laughs> All right, Josh. Well, we appreciate the update. No problem. It's really been a breakout season for Jordan Westerkamp. We thought we'd bring him front and center in the latest installment of Huskers Up Close. Um, ever since I can remember, I've been doing catching drills, you know, with my dad and since I was, you know, this tall, to, you know, all the way up to now, catching, you know, in, like in the summertime during high school, I'd be catching 100 balls a day, every day. Um, never did any, like, behind the back drills. Uh, that play was, it was just a, that was a crazy play and, um, you know, I was you know, fortunate to make, to have that play and uh, not really any secrets to it, just a lot of practice, a lot of uh, consistency of, you know, just catching the ball. Yeah, um, Time and I, we've got a great relationship on and off the field. Um, we got a hold of each other our summer coming in here to Nebraska, just like two and a half years ago now. And uh, um, he asked me if he wanted a room together. And I said, yeah, of course, you know, quarterback, wide receiver. We thought, hey, that'd be a good idea. And I've, you know, I've lived with him ever since. So um, he's been one of my best friends, you know, he's like a brother to me. And, uh, um, you know, we have a great relationship and it shows, you know, on and off the field. And uh, he's a great leader, he's a great football player. And, you know, I'm glad he's our captain. Playing in Memorial Stadium, is, it's unbelievable. Um, there's no other place like it, in, in my opinion. Uh, coming out and having that tunnel walk, it just, it's insane. It's crazy, the feeling you get, the rush you get, running out of the tunnel and seeing all the fans. and It's, it's unbelievable. Like I said before, our fan base is awesome. Um, great fans, love them, appreciate everything. Um, but uh, there's no place like Nebraska. Well, Jordan Westerkamp obviously off to a tremendous season. We'll look for great things for him during conference play. We've got a winner in our first trivia question of the night. Doug Volkmer of Lincoln knew the answer to this question. How many players on that Miami team in 2001 would eventually be drafted in the NFL? 38. It's a pretty substantial number from that 2001 roster. Here's tonight's second trivia question. Open to email, Facebook, and Twitter. Have the first correct answer. You'll receive a copy of The Legend of Little Red and the Big Red Wrap-Up Tee size extra large. The 1976 season was the last time Nebraska slated a regular season home matchup against the University of Miami. That game, too, ended in Nebraska's favor with a 19-7 win. Two touchdown passes from quarterback Vince Ferragamo put the Huskers on top. Which two players were on the receiving end of those passes? Have the first correct answer out of email, Facebook, Twitter. You'll receive the legend of Little Red and the wrap-up tee. We've still got the Fiji standing by in the call center. Give us a call, send an email, post to our Facebook page, or tweet at us. We're ready to take your questions. A Facebook post welcomes our guest, former Husker running back and friend of the show, Damon Benning, back with us on Big Red Wrap. But Barry says okay. on the Facebook page, pretty stoked to see and hear Damon Benning tonight. My wife is more into seeing him. <laughs> sort of jealous. That would be a hashtag, I think, that you put on the end of that thing. Damon's an attractive man, and he joins us on Big Red Wrap-Up. Okay. Hi. Well, that's a little awkward. But yeah. <laughs> I'll take what I can get. I was going to say, let's, let's not look a gift compliment in the mouth. No, absolutely not, especially from one as uh, distinguished as yourself. Well, it's actually very complimenting. You know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just the guy <laughs> facilitating the conversation. I, I love the messenger. In this it, yes. Of course, Damon uh, hosts a fine radio program from 7 to 11, Sharp and Benning in the Morning on 1620 The Zone in Omaha, 7 a.m. to 11 a.m., the obligatory plug Completed. Listen that's, to Damon every morning. That's why we're good buds. Whining about the Dodgers and why, the, why they're not getting it done. Yeah, we got a big one tonight. <laughs> Baumgartner and Granky, so uh, we'll see how cranky I get after that one. Well, you'll be cranky regardless. All right, let's talk questions and let's talk Miami because we've got a ton of people who have been Facebooking and tweeting us. And we want to get as many of your questions answered, and we'll get to those questions. But just your overall impressions, what you saw, what you liked, what you didn't like on Saturday night. Well, I was pretty impressed. I, I think the big thing was, uh, for me, as, a, as an offensive coordinator, I know Coach Beck has been much maligned and often criticized. And, and I thought Saturday night was a good testament to not only his perseverance, but patience as well. Uh, with Miami, I, I scratched my head a little bit about how they failed to make adjustments. I, you know, pre-snap looks, you get a good read, and then you see that Nebraska has got seven players. You have five offensive linemen, a quarterback, and a running back, and you see Miami playing too high. And uh, they've got six players in the box. And, and until they made some adjustments, you thought it was going to be a long night. And Miami panicked a little bit. That first touchdown to Kenny Bell, they, they rolled a safety down and played one high, and they got beat over the top. And I think after that, they were a little sketchy. 
in terms of playing one high, but uh, Coach Beck's patience, uh, I think, was, uh, was probably the best attribute of the night. Nebraska's kicking game is continuing to get better, and for the first time in a long time, even though they had double-digit turnovers, it didn't, it didn't stick out necessarily as, as, as deal killers while they were uh, still managed to go a plus one. I think defensively, um, still trying to show the ability to be multiple in terms of being, play, being able to play man, uh, a little more zone, uh, get out of that matchup zone a little bit and that quarters coverage that they like to use. Uh, the, the blueprint, I think, is well documented for how to attack Nebraska's defense. So I think their versatility uh, and the ability to be versatile can pay dividends as they start the Big Ten season. Uh, A-Dub says cooking dinner watching the show doesn't get any better than this. Depends on what you're cooking. I mean, like <laughs> uh, Zach asks a question about Amir Abdullah. And as a former running back, I wanted to get your thoughts on Amir because I know you're a huge fan and mm -hmm. you have been an unabashed fan for many years of Amir. But Zach wants to know on Twitter, do you think Amir Abdullah is the best running back in the country over Gurley and Gordon, who are two guys who are often mentioned as the best running backs in the country? Well, I think without question, he's better than Melvin Gordon. Uh, Todd Gurley, that's a different discussion, but one in which can be had. With, you compare him to Melvin Gordon, Melvin Gordon is a guy that, uh, as you, if you listen to the show, that I've studied quite a bit, uh, charted his first 70 runs last year. I think 68% of those, uh, he wasn't touched within the first five yards. So not that there are such things as easy runs, but he doesn't near have Amir's versatility. You know, Amir Abdullah is one of those guys that has some of the best five and six yard runs in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, he is electric. His ability to change directions and in small spaces is outstanding. You complement that with his balance and his pass catching ability. I think he uh, is almost a standalone figure. With Todd Gurley, uh, equally as impressive. You know, anytime you're 6'2", you're 226, he's gonna be a, a high 4'4 guy with enough wiggle to make him dangerous and a whole lot of speed and power to make him a handful. I don't think you could go wrong with either one of those two guys, but I think in some order they're one and one A with everybody else uh, chasing the rear. David, what do you th <clears throat> excuse me? What do you think about Amir handling kickoffs? I'm a big fan. You a big I, fan of that? I am. I had to make a living with special teams uh, in the return game, and so I'm appreciative of guys that uh, understand that the kicking game is a way to change the game in a hurry. We always talk about there's three facets, yet there seems to be this underlying reluctance to use starters on special teams. If if you want to put your money where your mouth is and say that there are three phases to the game and the kicking game is part of that, then I'm all for best players being out there. He is dangerous. Uh, and as we saw with Mc McNeese State, you have the ability to change the course of a game because as we know, uh, the fame catch started with the fame kick return. One of the areas that has to be a concern, and it is judging by what I'm seeing on the Facebook and Twitter pages tonight, health in the linebacking core. The news today that David Santos was at practice with a brace on his knee. Again, we don't know what the official word is. Coach Pelini doesn't speak until Thursday. What is that? If that is something that keeps David Santos out for any amount of time, how big of a, how big of a setback is that for Nebraska's defense, if it is at all? Well, it's a setback. I think he was one of the guys that uh, in their nickel uh, package stayed on the football field. Nebraska has been forced to play an inordinate amount of nickel and dime. I don't know if if that's to cover up some other deficiencies or not, but they seem to be comfortable uh, getting out of their even front package. And so if Santos is down for any extended period of time, it has to be next man up. That means guys like Trevor Roach, guys like Courtney Love, folks that have been on the cusp uh, and ready to have some spillover effect have to be ready to go. And the other thing is, is Nebraska has to be creative now with their personnel groupings in terms of how they want to use their nickel and dime packages. They're going to see a team in Illinois uh, you'll see very little two-back. Uh, you'll see a lot of 10 personnel and a lot of 11 personnel, which I think will allow Nebraska uh, some staying power this week. But you don't necessarily know what you're going to get in the following weeks when you when a team like uh, you visit a team like Michigan State and, and guys like uh, Josiah, who's playing a good tight end right now for them, one of their leading receivers, and they can get versatile with multiple backs in the backfield. David, with, with this defensive scheme that Coach Bo uses, mm -hmm. He puts a lot of pressure where the linebacker is most of the time one-on-one -on -one with the running back because of the matchup zone. Can you explain a, a little bit of, of how that you know, impacts what these linebackers are responsible for on every play? Yeah, it's difficult. Uh, anytime, if they, see some, if they see one back personnel and, and a team has got 
you know, two receivers to each side. Nebraska likes to play matchup zone or bracket coverage. That means they've got they try to high low you with those four receivers, whether it be some combination of linebacker, safety, or corner safety plan over the top. So uh, a lot of those a lot of those swing routes and motions out of the backfield uh, are, are are covered by by middle linebackers and. The interesting thing with Nebraska is if you take a look at some of their, their how they set their strength, the mics have to almost play sometimes like a will. If there's a if there's a tight end to one side and three receivers to another, Nebraska would just as soon give a strength call to the three receiver side and not the tight end side, which in essence makes a guy like Josh Banderas playing like a will right. to the open side. So the responsibility uh, for that linebacking course, pretty hefty, and it kind of gives you a little background when folks say that while it's secondary, not necessary that you know all three positions, the more familiar you are with what the Buck, the Will, and the Mike are doing, the better you're probably going to be as a linebacker as a whole. Right. Well, we'd love to hear from you with your comments and questions. We're introducing a new way to interact with us here at the show. We want you to send your best questions in a video. Go to either Facebook or Instagram, upload those videos, use the hashtag Big Red Wrap Up, post the videos for your chance to see yourself on the show. We'll send you prizes. We'll bribe you. Yeah, we'll, we'll give you stuff for the best video that week featured on the show. Back to your questions now and comments and posts from Facebook. I mean, there are a lot of people who are very excited about what they saw from Nebraska, and they want to know how it carries over into conference play. What do you see from the team we've seen through four games? How does that translate to Big Ten competition? Well, I'll talk about the intangibles first. I, I think first and foremost, from a leadership standpoint, Nebraska is fortunate on where their leaders are. I think the leader in the secondary is Corey Cooper. And while he hasn't played his best football yet, he has one of those personalities that does not waver. He is extremely steady, and he's even killed. That bodes well, I think, for that secondary. You've got a guy like Josh Mitchell who is the consummate competitor. He's the mouthpiece. Uh, when you get up front to that D-line, your silent assassins up front are Malik Collins and Vincent Valentine, both guys that stay the course. Nebraska's in a unique situation where the best player on defense doesn't have to be necessarily their leader and a guy like Randy Gregory. So when you're talking about temperament, if you're coming off a of success or failure, you like some key guys in that spot. Then you flip over to the other side of the ball. I imagine there's some jostling going on between whose huddle it is. But the thing that you have to love about Tommy Armstrong is when he speaks, the whole world listens. While mature, why Amir Abdullah might be uh, their most mature leader and arguably the backbone of that offense, he is smart enough and mature enough to understand that without tremendous quarterback leadership, that offense isn't near as effective. So I think he yields some of that to Tommy Armstrong and Tommy Armstrong's presence uh, commands that as well. So it's kind of a nice blend. As they get ready for Big Ten play, it's fortunate, and, it's, and I think in hindsight, it's a blessing in disguise that McNeese State happened when it did because there were two things that happened. Number one, uh, there's no bigger motivator sometimes than fear. Mm -hmm. And Nebraska was scared uh, and scared to lose that game. And so you, you find yourself finding ways not to visit that sentiment again, which in essence keeps you sharp. The beautiful thing about the Illinois game coming up as it starts the Big Ten play, it's a, it's a night game. The crowd gets a chance to get worked up into a lather. The players will be excited, and I think that has a built-in way of keeping you sharp. And, oh, by the way, you get to play on television as well. That's a mm -hmm. plus. Yeah. Uh, Colin wants to know if Damon hates Miami as much as he does. Um, you know, I don't. there's only a couple <laughs> teams I have disdain for. And, unfortunately, two of my favorite backs of all time actually played at Miami. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a big Clinton Portis guy, and I love Edger and James, so I apologize that. Uh, I apologize for that. But uh, there's only two teams I have that strong of a disdain for, and that belongs to Colorado and Texas. Yeah. Everybody else outside Amen. of that, I can stomach. Now, Amen. Colin, send us a Facebook post <coughs> asking how many teams Damon is a fan of. <laughs> We're going to run out of time. Uh, that, that, that has point. grown legs over the years. <laughs> uh, Josh says, do you think Nebraska will continue pounding it out on the ground, or will they go back to more of a 50-50 split? Well, I, I think they want to be efficient. So I know there was much to do about taking snippets out of press game conference or post game uh, press conferences where Coach Blaine and Coach Beck alluded to the fact that we'll take what defenses give us. And there are some folks out there that, that, uh, that took that in the literal sense. And what I think that means is it, it, you, you saw it on Saturday. 
you saw a team that in Miami that did not want to come out of that too high look. Nebraska took what the defense gave them. In this particular game, it meant staying the course in the run game. Now, you get some eight-man fronts or a lot of one high, you won't have near as effectiveness with the zone game, but Nebraska can, let's say, go to their power G scheme. Uh, they can run quarterback counter, and they can throw the football. So in that regard, it wasn't the literal sense in terms of, well, you know, I know a team's going to try to take away our strength, so we'll try to be good at something we don't do. I don't believe that's what that statement meant at all. And if you're in Nebraska, you just want to continue to be efficient. You want to run the ball, not when you want to run the ball, but when you have to run the ball. If Nebraska can pull that off, they're going to have success because I just don't think teams can make a living playing much man-to-man -man and one high against Nebraska if you want to have any success. I've heard your thoughts on this, but we've had several people ask to give, give us your thoughts on the roughing the passer call because that drew a lot of fire both from the sidelines during the game mm -hmm. and in Facebook and Twitter and social media world, and I'm sure on message boards as well, during the course of the game. This is the controversial roughing the passer call that took an interception away from Nebraska. Your thoughts? Well, you know, it was obviously a bad call, but I'm probably the wrong guy to ask to give you um, a, a solid objective opinion. I've been part of some teams that were on the receiving end of some very poor calls. Uh, the most notable was in the 93 bowl game against Florida State where uh, we had numerous poor calls and I've been conditioned uh, to not lend that much credence. We stay the course, we continue to play, you don't get caught up. Because that was what your head coach was preaching at the time. W without sure. question. Yeah. Uh, just the, the, the ability to maximize in the moment and stay the course that's something that's kind of ingrained in my system. So when you see a bad call like that, you understand that it was a bad call, you understand human error, but you continue to keep playing. What I'm not a fan of is allowing your emotions to get the best of you anytime after that. David, well, is, it, is it a bad call given the framework of the rules that we have today? Well, within the because context of protecting the quarterback and going low, mm -hmm. the answer to that question is no, it's not a bad call at right. all. I can see... We, the, none of us agree with it. No, I, yeah. I, I can but, see what the officials yeah. are saying, but I still, it's hard in the moment to imply intent. Now, were, was there intent to go low? I don't think so, but it's a bang, bang play. I understand it is what it is. And again, you got to continue yeah. to stay the course. And there are, there are several rules in the rule book that will clearly state if there's a question in your mind, this is a referee. If there's a question in your mind about whether it's a call or not, Throw the flag. Yeah, without so, I, I've got. That's I've just got, the way it is. Yeah, and I've got no real problems with yeah, that. There are yeah. folks that were sitting around me when that call happened, and I don't even think I got out of my seat. Well, what yeah. about what about you guys thinking about the the scuffles throughout this game? So there's a scuffle after this rough in the passer call and everything. There, you're a coach, Damon, mm -hmm. and you're also we've we've been players. And when you see one of your guys get into a scuffle, as a coach, you know that you're supposed to stop the fight, but. Can you let that happen? I mean, think about that, man. Think about when your guy was getting attacked. You go defend him, right? I'll, give you, what do you I'll do? give you the honest answer. This is the non-corporate, non-PC answer. If I'm a coach, I'll probably allow for one of those. And I'm going to be okay with it. Because I think you have to set the tone. I'm not asking for a personal foul, but folks on the other team have to understand that this is a heavyweight fight. And if you want to go four quarters, you have to be willing to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. So I'm probably okay with my players going there at least once, but when you start to make a habit and you show that you don't have the ability to be disciplined, I'm all for sending a message, but I like self-control a lot better. So that's kind of the waffling way to say, I'm okay with the scuffle, let's just keep it at a minimum. Yeah. <laughs> And make sure you keep your helmet on. Yeah, yeah I never yeah. understood that. <laughs> You're not going to hurt anybody. <laughs> yeah, the You're first thing that players want to do is take their helmet off, <laughs> right? right? No. <laughs> well, we, we know that you have a radio show in, gosh, under 24. Well, no, I'm sorry, under 12 hours yes. now. So we'll let you go. But thank you very much. <laughs> oh, I appreciate 7 it. 7 a.m. 7, 7, 7 to 11. It's my goodness. Sharpen, sharpen the other guy. I'm glad that's not me. <laughs> uh, well, up next on the wrap-up, Sean Callahan is here with all the latest Big Red recruiting news. And as we go to break, let's look back at last week's Nebraska win over Miami, courtesy of Aaron Babcock at Hale Varsity. We're back in just a couple of minutes.
This seems like getting the Rangers. That's right. Well, these are a 5 nothing. 5 now? What is the uh, DB? Is, uh, no, no score. Deshaun. Yes. Hey, Kevin Kugler, uh, Sean Callahan, Adrian Fiala, Blake Lawrence, how are you this evening? I'm doing good. How are you? All right. That is Mr. Neal. Damon Benning says hello. Yeah, tell him we'll see them in two oh, weeks. Tell him hello. Damon, Damon says he'll see you in two weeks. We'll be ready. He, he, would, he, would, he, would prefer, he would prefer that you not have a very good game against him. <laughs> uh, well, we appreciate your time. We're going uh, to take a quick, uh, we're in the midst of a quick break. And when we come back, we'll get right to you. All right, so hang on the line. Okay. I appreciate your time tonight. That you got to get so like in the back there's an arrow that points up and it says Thanks for joining us tonight on The Wrap-Up. I'm Kevin Kugler. Be sure to vote on this week's sideline survey question. Where do you think Nebraska will finish in the Big Ten West Division? 80% of you say first, 17% say second. There's a 1% and sixth. Boy, that'd be a really surprising event. Visit our Facebook page or The Wrap-Up website and vote in our unscientific poll. Karen Dahlcutter knew the answer to our second bigger trivia question. What two Huskers were on the receiving end of touchdown passes against Miami? A lot of you knew it. Karen knew it quicker than you. And there's your answer. Chuck Molito and Dave Shamblin. Congratulations to Karen. She had the fastest fingers and wins the prize. Time now to welcome Sean Callahan from Husker Online. Hi. Good evening, guys. We've heard a lot about how fans felt about the experience on Saturday night. The excitement, the noise, the game. What was the reaction from recruits in attendance? You know, really, Nebraska couldn't have had a better weekend. You had a night game, beautiful weather, Miami in town. Probably the best atmosphere we've seen in the stadium in quite some time. And Nebraska played well. Uh, so, you know, when you're trying to sell Nebraska uh, from a recruiting end, this is about as good as it gets. Nebraska had 10 official visitors, but really 11. Uh, Jackson Perry flew in from Vegas uh, with his family, stayed the weekend, but paid for his own trip. He's going to come out for a later visit. Uh, but you break down this group of 11 guys, uh, several top names were here. Uh, you had four current Husker commits in that group, uh, the Davis Twins and Christian Gaylord and Eric Lee. Uh, but just several guys from places like Florida, South Carolina, Louisiana. A uh, couple that I want to hit on, Jackson Perry, the, the lineman from Las Vegas. He's probably the one that we could see committing um, here anytime soon. He'll probably come back again, uh, but he's from Bishop Gorman, offensive lineman, could play defensive lineman. Um, another guy I thought that they really opened eyes with was Desh uh, Deshaun Raymond. He's a four-star defensive back out of Louisiana, uh, was really blown away by the trip. In fact, his brother visited Nebraska a couple years ago and, and ended up going to LSU uh, left LSU. You know how they kind of guys in the SEC come and go, and he realizes he made a mistake going to LSU and told his brother, I wish I would have went to Nebraska, um, and Charlton Warren did a great job. So a lot of guys, the, the quarterback that was in town, Lamar Jackson, uh, four-star quarterback, um, you know, I think Nebraska's in really good position with him to flip him from Louisville, uh, but he's still, I think, going to look at a couple other options. Okay, mm -hmm. Interesting week, and we'll talk about what's coming up this weekend in just a little bit, but Deshaun Neal, is joining us from Omaha right now to talk a little bit of football. Deshaun, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Welcome to Big Red Wrap-Up. Thank you for having me on the show. You know, we appreciate you taking a few minutes for us tonight. We've heard about some of the guys who were in town this weekend. I know you were watching the game. Kind of your thoughts on what you saw from Nebraska in that win over Miami. Well, uh, I, love, I love the atmosphere of the entire uh, arena. I mean, I had a good time watching Randy Gregory do his thing against the offensive line of Miami. I had a good time watching Amir four break tackles. 
And I also had a good time just sitting back and just enjoying the fans. And uh, just, I'm just glad I'm going to be a future Husker and be able to play for something great. Hey, Deshaun, explain your story uh, to Husker fans listening here tonight. Uh, you know, you're a guy that, as a junior, didn't get a lot of notoriety, but all of a sudden this spring, Nebraska offered you. Um, you know, a lot of colleges looked at you, and uh, your stock kind of soared through the roof. Uh, just how did you get on the map, and, and, and what made Nebraska offer you? And then obviously you pulled the trigger to, to commit this spring. Well, uh, my dad and I have been working really hard since I got here my sophomore year. My dad's been getting me ready for this moment. And uh, what we did was we went to the circuit of camps, and then um, I had to the unofficial visit to Oklahoma State, and uh, they were getting ready to offer me right then and there. But then my dad and I were talking about committing, and then when I had notified all the other universities I was getting ready to commit. And uh, the time I got back back to Omaha, I got a call from Coach Cotton, and they told me they would uh, rewatch my film, and they, they were looking forward to having me a part of the team. So then about 27 minutes later, I called back and told them I'd become a <laughs> About 27 <laughs> minutes later, so not, not 28 or 26, huh? <laughs> no, 27. <laughs> Deshaun, if you look at this Nebraska defensive line, you have two different types of defensive ends, Greg McMullen and Randy Gregory. Which one uh, do you liken yourself to more, and what makes you think you, you play more like uh, Gregory or McMullen? Uh, I love watching both of them now, really close to both of them. I like to sit back and study the technique. Every time my dad goes to the game, he makes sure I'm sitting back and watching both of them. But uh, I really like the way of uh, Rennie Gregory's play style because he's very athletic, he's tall just like I am, and he uh, pursues the ball very well and he's very fast. Deshaun, in terms of coming to Nebraska, was there any one thing about the program that really swayed you to Nebraska, or were there several things uh, involved there? Uh, there were several things. I mean, the fan base one. I'm just, uh, the the games are always sold out. So I mean, every everybody comes in, in from the state just to come watch Nebraska play. Uh, the coaching staff is great. I have a great relationship with Coach Cass, Coach Cogman, Coach Bo, Coach Papuchis, and the rest of the coaching staff. And I, I like the university, the facilities, and uh, it's right down the road for my family members to be able to come and watch me every Saturday. So it's a perfect place for me to be. Deshaun, awesome. one thing you notice when, when we watch you, whether in person or in highlights, is that you have the knack that it seems like it takes a lot of defensive ends, a lot of time to learn. But you seem to already have the knack of if you know you're not getting to the quarterback, you have no problem jumping up and blocking a pass. How much time do you work on, okay, I know I'm not getting to the quarterback, so I'm going to settle back in and try to deflect that pass and knock it down? Well, I mean, it's just kind of in the game type thing. I just realize it and I try to do the best I can to – to make a negative play on the offensive side of the ball so I can make a positive on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, my dad's been teaching me everything I can do on defensive end position. I've been watching other defensive end. I've been, watching, I've been studying uh, Deacon Jones, so I, I like to uh, try to do the best I can, even if I know that when I'm pursuing the ball, I'm not going to get there. I still like to try to do my best to make sure I can help my teammates out there make better plays and the better themselves at the team. Hey, Deshaun, how much has life changed for you on the football field now that you've had four games being a Husker commit? Do you notice teams uh, pick you out more, scheme against you a lot more than maybe as a junior? Uh, yes, my well, life changed uh, dramatically. I mean, my dad told me the day that I, was, that I committed in those 27 minutes that my life was going to change. And uh, it's shown out here in the games that every time I put my hand down the dirt to get ready to go make a play, the ball goes opposite way of me about 97% of the time. So, I mean, it's a, it's a challenge, but I like, I, it just shows that I can become a much better athlete, a much better football player and a student of the game and how to – better get off of blocks much faster and they'll get much faster and stronger and recognize and re-off the schemes and pursue the ball much quicker. Deshaun Neal, Omaha Central and Nebraska commit. Congratulations on the commitment. Best of luck the rest of the year, Deshaun. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Deshaun Neal, we stay in state, though, because we go from Omaha, drive through Lincoln, go south, and find Beatrice for our next talk. <laughs> yeah, Jessup Workman, uh, one of the more hard-nosed players you're going to see in the state of Nebraska. He's a commitment to South Dakota State. Uh, he, he's a state championship caliber wrestler, six foot one, 200 pounds, uh, workhorse. I mean, the la last name Workman just fits him to a T. Uh, you know, as a linebacker, you know, he plays hard, he plays tough. But as a running back, you know, he's the kind of guy that will carry the football for Beatrice 35, 40 times in a game sometimes a, a year ago. And, uh, you know, he's doing that again this year. You will not see another player in the state, uh, you know, take more carries and play defense like a Jessup Workman. 
Are they playing well this year, Beatrice? Yeah, they are. You know, they lost to Scud early, and Scud is the number one team and defending state champion. Uh, but Workman is without a doubt, you know, one of the top five players in Class B, and and, and right up there probably is one of the top ten overall guys in the state. Um, I know it was kind of on the fringe of maybe that Wyoming, Ohio offer, uh, but South Dakota State has done a really good job in, in, in getting these guys to commit early. Let's talk this weekend. Another night game, another opportunity for some recruits. Who's coming in that we know of so far? Well, right now, four visitors, two of them Husker commits. The big one that we just confirmed today was Christian Bell, uh, a four-star Alabama defensive end commit from Hoover, Alabama. And, um, you know, he actually reached out to Nebraska and, and was intrigued about visiting. And you don't see that very often, um, a Nick Saban commit shopping around. So that's something to watch closely uh, that he reached out to the Husker staff. You know, we don't know the details right now, whether he was upset about maybe something Alabama's done with their recruiting that made him want to go look around. But uh, for Nebraska, it's good news. They're going to have a four-star defensive end here on campus. Uh, Diedrich Young, a running back out of Peoria, Illinois, a three-star running back, will also be here as well. That should be an interesting weekend, and more may happen throughout the course of the week. And, of course, Husker Online will have all that up-to-date as the week goes on. Nebraska begins Big Ten Conference play on Saturday as they don their alternate uniforms to welcome Illinois back to Memorial Stadium. Hope those numbers are easy to see. For a preview of that game and our predictions, go to our Facebook page or the wrap-up website. Click on the prediction. Adrian Blake and I will tell you exactly what to expect on Saturday. It's another late game kickoff between the Huskers and Fighting Illini scheduled for 8 p.m. on BTN. Next Tuesday, we have a special episode of Big Red Wrap-Up. We are at the Champions Club. Should be a great night. We'll recap the game with Matt Davison and Jay Foreman, 7 o'clock Central Time. It'll be a lot of fun. Don't miss it. Always a lot of energy when we've got that live studio audience in the studio with us in the Champions Club. Cannot wait for next week. And Nebraska starting off Big Ten play with Illinois. We'll get a chance to break that down with Matt and with Jay. Our thanks tonight to Sean Callahan and to Damon Benning for joining us, and also thanks to Josh and the boys in the Wrap-Up Call Center. Now, for Adrian Fiala and Blake Lawrence, I'm Kevin Kugler. We'll see you right back here next Tuesday night from the Champions Club on NET's Big Red Wrap-Up. Good night, everybody.